And God. 
Almighty God and Heavenly Father, glory and honor be to your name. Father, we thank you that we have a memorial to remind us how fortunate we are to stand before you without Jesus is not only separation, but it's hell. We thank you, Father, that you devised a plan where man does not have to go to hell, but man can go to heaven. You sent the only one who could go behind the veil, who could satisfy your demand, and that is Jesus. We thank you for the privilege of being a part of the kingdom through your grace, mercy, and love. And as we think about the body he instituted, may we partake of it in a manner that pleases you well. May we reflect upon how our lives are in you and make those necessary adjustments before it's eternally too late. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. We continue, thanks, Father, for what's in the cup became what satisfied your demand of wrath. And now we can be called children of God. Thank you, Father, and it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the King. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, while as ransomed ones we sing. Marching on and on, marching on and on, for Christ count everything but love. For the King of Kings, still tore lasting beneath the banner on the cross. Over land and sea, wherever man may dwell, make the glorious tidings known. Of the crimson banner, now the story tell, while the Lord shall claim his own. Marching on and on, marching on and on. Christ count everything but love. everything but love. for the King of Kings still for lasting beneath the banner on the cross when the great commander from the vaulted sky sounds the resurrection day then before our king the faint and foe shall die and the saints shall march away marching on and on marching on and on for christ count everything but love. everything but love. for the king of kings still for lasting beneath the banner on the cross I want to revisit something that we've revisited countless times. I, I don't even know how many times I've preached about this, but I say this with all due respect to our governor. A few weeks ago with the pandemic taking place, and in my opinion, we overreacted, but that's another time. There's something our governor said that really bothered me. She said churches are not essential. She even went so far in the statement to, to insinuate that churches shouldn't even really be existing right now. And I understand her reasoning. It was to stop the spread. It was to keep the spread from going. But all I could think about is that somebody really has been enjoying the last three months of this pandemic. When people are at home, and I thank God we get to do this through Zoom, I thank God we get to do it through Facebook, we get to do it through YouTube, there may be other platforms, I just don't know any other platforms. 
But is the church, as our governor said, non-essential? Well, I want you to look with me this morning for just a few minutes in something you and I have visited before, something you and I have talked about before. When we study with people, we try to tell them this is the church that we adhere to which we adhere. Now, we have some misconceptions about the church. Oh, a few years ago, I think it was about 20 years ago, there was a movement in the church to stop even using the word church. And the reason to stop using the word church is because when people associate it with a building and, and they associate it with something physical that we really shouldn't be doing that. And I understand that. The church is not the building. We can meet, and this is the advantage we have with video. We can meet in the forest. We can meet out in the parking lot. We can meet in each other's homes, and we would still be acceptable to God. A few years ago, a man and I were sitting at the cafe, and he said, you know what the most beautiful church is, Preach? And I said, what? And he said, Fort Bayard. And I said, no, sir, you have the wrong conception of church. The church is people, individual members collectively belonging to a body. And I know there are some people that just get all bent out of shape and riled up because you call it the church. But let's get back to the idea that Jesus established back in Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 19. Let's talk about the location. You ever given consideration as to where Jesus brought up this discussion? It is in a place called Caesarea Philippi. That's the same place that Philip was preaching the gospel. In fact, he was bringing a lot of people to Christ before he was told to go and talk to the Ethiopian eunuch. And in Acts 8, verses 26 to 40, he taught the Ethiopian eunuch the gospel. But it is not the place that Philip got to unlock the keys to the kingdom of heaven. In fact, you would have thought that Philip, since he was in Caesarea Philippi, could have preached the gospel to Cornelius in Acts 10. But in verse 19 of our text, and I say to you, you're Peter, you will unlock the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so it is, it is Jesus who tells Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 that his alms, his gifts, have come up as a memorial before God. But he's not right with God. And so he, sent, he tells Cornelius to send to Simon the Tanner's house and to send for Simon Peter, and he'll tell you what you need to do in order to be saved. Would it shock you if I told you that Jesus will not tell you how to get to heaven? Oh, don't get me wrong. I know you can read it in the scriptures, but Jesus will never directly tell you. He never told anybody directly how to become a Christian. He sent people to do it. That's a Christian's responsibility. And, of course, you remember the story in Acts chapter 10. He is there at, at uh, Simon the Tanner's house. It's almost lunchtime. And he sees this great image. It looks like a sheep bound at the four corners of the earth. And every unclean animal is on it. He hears God say to him, Peter, rise, kill, and eat all three times. And all three times, God hears him say, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything cleansed, or I've never eaten anything unclean or common. And God left him and said, do not call what I have cleansed common. While Peter is trying to figure out what this vision is about, the men from Cornelius arrive at Simon the Tanner's house, and the angel tells him to go with them. And he tells, he tells Cornelius and his household what they need to do in order to be saved. And 
not only were they baptized in the Holy Spirit to indicate that the kingdom was also given to Gentiles, but they also were physically immersed in water for the remission of their sins and raised to walk a new life. He took their popular beliefs, talking about Jesus, and he changed them to truth beliefs. There are a whole lot of popular beliefs today that people have. For example, the Lord's Prayer. In my opinion, the Lord's Prayer is the greatest deception Satan has ever given people. I have a, a Bible that a denomination gave me. And in the front of it, it says, if you'll pray this prayer, you will be saved. And they quote from Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, which if you took them to task on it, they would think you're crazy. You have to confess before you believe. That's what it says. And there's no truth in that. It's a good start. It's a great way to start your life. But if you'll read each of the occasions in which someone was told what they needed to do in order to be saved, you know it's repent or hear, repent, Believe, confess, be immersed in water, and live a life of faithfulness. Well, by this time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had done an awesome job, and I say awesome in their standards, and by human standards of discrediting Jesus. You see, Jesus didn't ask the question out of ignorance. But he asked his 12 disciples to get their attention, who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? See, there were many prophecies made about the Messiah. I just give you the first, gave you the first one. The first was made in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head. Literally, the Hebrew is he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. I've been told, I've never had the courage to see it, just never had the opportunity to see it either, that in the movie, the, the, the one where they portray about Jesus being crucified, that there's a picture of the serpent. A friend of mine said, you and I will know what that is immediately, but most people won't. And when they asked uh, Mel Harris about the, or Mel, um, I'm sorry, when they asked the, the movie guy who did it, was it really this way? I didn't think he personally handled it well, because I'll tell you, it was worse than what they portrayed in the movie. You see, the accepted fact that Jesus was the Messiah was evaporating because of the misconceptions of Jesus. Let me give you two of them. The first thing is, is they took Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, and they thought he literally was coming with this huge army to get rid of the Romans. Now, let me read to you. Let me share with you. Let me encourage you to go to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and there will be no end, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so when Jesus didn't come with this enormous army, he didn't come from heaven with this enormous army to get rid of these Romans so that they could go back to rightfully ruling the world as they were supposed to. Well, they're still waiting. In fact, I'm told by some people that they are that Israel is building a temple. Israel is building a throne for Jesus to set upon and to occupy. I said, well, I've been told by others that he's already doing it. I've also been told by others that he's going to appear simultaneously on everyone's televisions. It's almost gonna be like 
if you were born and raised like I was, beep, 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 and then some major weather thing comes on and they interrupt programming. Well, that's what Jesus is supposed to do, according to some people. And I asked this individual who was telling me this, well, what about the people in Africa that don't have a television? What about the people in other parts of the world that don't have TV? Are they gonna miss Jesus coming when Revelation 1 and verse 5 says he's coming and every eye will see him? Well, as a cop out, what do they normally do? You just wanna create trouble, Dwayne. You just wanna create all kinds of issues. Well, you see, Jesus didn't come with an army. He didn't get rid of these Romans. And so he just couldn't be the Messiah. Well, let's look at Mark 4, verses 35 to 41. Here is Jesus. He is in the boat on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. And he's in the stern of the ship, sound asleep on a pillow. In fact, some think that he was snoring. I personally think that he was. May be wrong. But all fathers snore, according to Bill Cosby. So uh, all men snore, according to, to others. So Jesus must have been snoring. Well, I can't prove that, so don't hold me to it. But what happens is, is that the winds and the waves are going against that ship so heavily that it almost is about to destroy the ship. What the disciples miss is, is that he's in the boat asleep. And so they wake him. And this is where the songwriter gets the idea of, in the song called Master the Tempest is Raging. They wake him up and say, do you care that we are perishing? Don't you even care that we are perishing? And by the way, the we in that context is not Jesus. It's those 12 men. And Jesus gets up. He commands the winds and the waves to stop. And they turn around and they ask each other, who is this guy? Now, wait a minute. They've been with him. They've watched him command demons. Go back to Mark chapter 1, if you don't believe me, on verse 14 and 15. What is it? What? One of the first things that he tells them is repent for the kingdom of heaven. Is it near or is it hand? And then he turns around and he goes to a set of demons that nobody would go to. He commands them to come out. They saw all of that. If they didn't see that, why was it written? And yet they still didn't know who this man is that can command the winds and the waves to obey him. In fact, if you just to add one more real quick, remember in what's the one story that's in all four of the gospels except for the crucifixion, the trials, the burial, the resurrection? It's the feeding of the approximate 5,000. In fact, these men didn't really know who Jesus was. In fact, Jesus tells them later, the only reason you stay with me is because you got your bellies full. Well, if it was already a evaporating fact that Jesus was the Messiah, what do you think Jesus really was trying to do? He spoke to them of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he called it leaven. In fact, Paul says the same thing about just a little bit of sin. I know what we try to do. We try to rationalize it. We try to say something like this. Oh, you know, it wasn't a bad sin. Lying's not a bad sin, but murder's a good sin. <laughs> sin is sin in God's eyes. And what we do is, is that we say, if it doesn't affect anybody else, it can't be really that bad. But what does Paul call it? First Corinthians 5, verse 6, and Galatians 5, verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. The discreditation of Jesus was evident in who Jesus was speaking to. I mean, these 12 men turned around and they said, when Jesus asked them, who do men say I, the son of man am? 
Now they never, never caught on, or if they did, they didn't say anything to the two words in that passage, I am. There's only one person that could call himself the I am, and that's God. And Jesus is calling himself the I am because he is. And so they, they said, um, well, John the Baptist. So that's what Herod thought. Herod thought that when he had executed John the Baptist and cut his head off, that this man was a reincarnated John the Baptist. But he wasn't. Well, some say you're Elijah. In fact, they, they always associated the spirit of Elijah with Jesus, even though Elijah was the forerunner of John the Baptist, Isaiah 40. And then, well, some say you're Jeremiah. And then some don't even know. They just said, one, you're one of the prophets. And this is why Jesus is a master teacher. Who do you say that I am? Just the other night at Renus Valley, Michael Brashears, the preacher, was talking about how a man was standing at Ace Hardware in Silver City and blaming God for the pandemic. And he said, if God was doing his job, we wouldn't be having this trouble. And yet, you know, just by the way he spoke, by the way he talked and the way he said things, he did, I, I'm not even sure he believes there's a God. And as Ruth Graham Lottritz, the daughter of Billy Graham said, we've kicked him out of school. We've kicked him out of government. We've told people keep him at church. And then we complain when God is not where we think he's supposed to be. And as she told that reporter on the Today Show, make up your mind, do you want God or not? Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Now, a lot of people give Peter credit or Simon credit when they shouldn't be giving him credit at all. Simon was not doing this necessarily. He wasn't motivated necessarily on pure standards. Now, Jesus is going to say he was, if this was revealed to him by the Father, yes. But each one of these men thought that he is the Messiah. Yeah, there were things he didn't do that they were always taught, but they were on this latter authority. And that when he was on earth, Jesus was going to pick the number two person. When he would speak about being crucified, Peter went, uh, went to rebuke him. And Jesus, before Peter could get one word out of his mouth, Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan, for you're not mindful of the things of God. You're mindful of the things of men. And so they were always, as I would say, jockeying for position to be number two, as Michael Myers would say on the movie, Austin Powers. And Jesus kept telling them, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom doesn't work like that. You're to be a servant. Simon said, you're the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus tells him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I see that word Petra. It's, it's classified as a rock, but in our minds, it would be just like a little rock, a little pebble. Because you see, what we know about Jesus is he is the rock. He's the Petros. Peter is the P-E-T-R-A. Jesus is the P-E-T-R-O-S. He's like the huge mountain. Now, let's talk about this word church for a minute, since so many people seem to get all bent out of shape about it. And this is one of the reasons I personally believe we've done a great injustice to kids 
because we don't teach them history. Where did this idea of this ecclesia come from? Where was this concept? Well, the father of democracy is a man by the name of Pericles. And he, in his research and his philosophy and his testing out of things, learned that the best way to govern people is themselves. And yet he knew that the Greek society as a whole couldn't test themselves, couldn't do what, what needed to be done. And so he proposed what was called the ecclesia. It's one of the first times you ever see it in history. The ecclesia was an assembly to be drawn out of the people, and they were to meet representing the whole people what was best for the people. And, and that is the church. Now, you don't like the word church. Okay, fine. It's the same word in Greek. It's the assembly. It is the coming together of Christians. In fact, Acts 8, 11 and verse 26 says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And so we get the word Christian. And as I said, the, the confession is the Petros, that is, upon this rock, I, or excuse me, the confession is, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and people have gotten bent out of shape about this, too. The confession is the Petros, because the confession is on the greatest foundation. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, there is no greater foundation than that which has already been laid the one, Jesus Christ. He's called the cornerstones in Psalm 118 and verse 26, and Peter used that in, in 1 Peter 2. And so sometimes pe people give Peter a whole lot more credit than he actually deserved. In fact, he says of himself in 1 Peter 5, that he's just a servant. You can't be as an elder lording it over people. What you do is you be a servant to the people. I want you to notice, though, it's the same Peter that denied the Lord three times. You see, thinking about who was going to be number two, Peter said, uh, Jesus uh, said, you will all deny me before this night. Peter, excuse me, they all looked at each other, and Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. In fact, if the others deny you, I will never deny you. In fact, I will die for you. Jesus said, before the rooster crows, according to Mark, twice, and before the rooster crows, according to Matthew and Luke, you'll deny me three times. What happened in verses 54 to 62 of Luke 22? I use Luke because I'm partial to this account. Peter denied the Lord three times, and he turned and looked at Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, he remembered the words Jesus said, and he went out and wept bitterly. Now, the wonderful thing is you go to John 21, and in the same steps, Peter denied the Lord three times, Jesus restored him on those three occasions. You see, death and the place of the dead, Hades, will not prevail against it. When you're a child of God, you don't have to worry about death. Now, let's be honest. We don't like death. We don't like anything to do. We don't want anything to do with death sometimes. In fact, I have a friend that is so petrified of death, it's going to scare him to death, pun intended. But when you're a child of God, you don't fear death. If you die, where are you going to end up eternally? If you're faithful to the Lord, you're going to end up in a whole lot better place called heaven than this. Now, we on this side, and I'm not being critical when I say this, are somewhat selfish. You see, we, we want to pull them back. We want to bring them back. I watched two men. One was around 88, 85, excuse me, 
no, excuse me, one was around 75 and the other was 74, been married to their spouses. One was married 58 years and the other was married 57 years. And one, as they were reminiscing and crying over their, the loss of their wives, one of those men said something I've never forgotten. He said, you know, Dwayne, I want my wife back, but I don't want her back the way she was. I don't want her back with her, with her skin just tearing. I don't want her back with her, with her body just drying up. I want to go to her. I've never forgotten those words. When Peter gets the keys to the kingdom of heaven, he unlocks them in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost. He unlocks it at Acts chapter 10 to Cornelius. And so the church is essential. Peter or Paul said in Ephesians 1 verse 22 and 23 that Jesus is the, but the church, I'm sorry, is the Lord's body. So for someone to say that the church is not essential, they're actually saying Jesus is not essential. People have long said, oh, they love Jesus. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi said, I could get along with Jesus real well. It's his followers I just have a major problem with. And you can sympathize with what Gandhi was saying, but see, Gandhi belonged to a religion that offers no eternal life. There's only one religion that offers eternal life, and that's Christianity. That's Jesus Christ. And if Jesus is the church, we must be a part of that church. We must be a part of what he requires. No, not what I require. You're not going to offend me if you go look in Scripture to see how to become a Christian. In fact, you probably will offend me more by not looking to the Scriptures. I can say all day long anything about the scriptures, but you know what Satan knows? He knows what I'm about to tell you. I can make the scriptures say anything I want it to say. Does it make it right? The answer is no. Because what God says in his word is always right. He created the church. Did he waste his time? Well, maybe a misunderstanding on the governor's part and I say it with all due respect, but Jesus and the governor have a difference of opinion. And I know who's going to win on that opinion. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all, to him I freely give.
said has brought honor and glory to your name, brought a smile to your face, and warmed your heart. We pray you that we'll accept our performance the best we know how. You'll forgive us when we have failed you, that you will clean us up and redirect us in how you want things done. Father, we do pray for our world. It seems to be in very tumultuous times. It's always been in tumultuous times, we know. But Father, if you took the chaos and created a place for us to live, you can also take the chaos and calm it down. We pray you'll do that. Father, with the pandemic and people that have lost loved ones to the pandemic, we lift those families up to you. Father, for those that have lost jobs, and we've heard about some already this week that that have lost jobs and we pray for them. Father, it seems like we just don't know where to go, but you've asked us to be still and know you're God. And Father, we pray that that's what we can use this time for. For all who need our prayers this morning, Father, we lift them up to you. We thank you for those who are doing much better. And Father, we just pray you'll continue to be with those who need our prayers this morning. Please forgive us of our sins. We do thank you for the greatest blessing being your son, Jesus. And we come to you knowing that without him, we would be sunk. Father, we ask you go with us this day and the rest of our lives as you've already done. We pray it again and that you'll forgive us when we have failed you. It is in and through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. <laughs> 